We seem to know a lot more history about outdoor gardening than indoor gardening. Yes, I know about the historic gardens of Babylon, the ancient wisdom of jade, and the healing properties of so many herbs that have been used for generations. But what about the monstera? What about the spider plants, the house plants that have also been in homes for generations? There are almost no books on specifically the history of houseplants until now. My plant friend and fellow OG planty podcaster Jane Perone has spent years accumulating stories, lore, and surprises, doing deep research about our beloved houseplants, and she's enlightening us about their history today. So welcome. Welcome to the Growing Joy podcast, where we not only learn how to care for plants successfully, but how to simply and affordably use our plant babies to cultivate more joy in our lives. I'm Maria, author of Growing Joy, The Plant Lover's Guide to Cultivating Happiness, speaker, podcaster, and most importantly, an epic plant killer turned happy plant lady. On Growing Joy, you'll find conversations about plant care, plant community, and wellness through the lens of plants. Welcome back, plant friends. I hope you've had beautifully planty weeks. I wanted to take a couple minutes at the top of the episode to welcome and thank a few listeners, some of the newest members of our Growing Joy Garden Society app. If you didn't know, the Growing Joy Garden Society is a made-over version of the community app that I launched before the rebrand. It's bigger, it's better, it's fancier, it's got all sorts of amazing things in it like a plant swap tab, monthly calls with the community where we hop on a call and talk about our plant collections. They're called Planty Show and Tells. A news feed where you can talk about houseplants, gardening, planty DIYs, and it's algorithm-free, troll-free, completely protected. So to our newest members, welcome Mir M, Martin Wolf, Katie Burkett, and Megan Wiggins. Lovely to see you in the Garden Society. Can't wait to get to know you better in the platform. If you're interested in joining, it's super affordable to join. You can go to jointhegardensociety.com and that's where you can sign up and just make sure that you select that $6.99 community plan. And that $6.99 not only goes to helping sustain the community platform, which has expenses, but it also helps me cultivate and create episodes for you on a weekly basis that are free. So thanks in advance. Okay, so I hope you've had beautifully planty weeks. I know I have as spring is in full swing. I've got my transplants ordered from Territorial Seed Company. My houseplants are all blooming and growing. I've got new monstera leaves. And my Hoya collection is doing really well. So I have all of my Hoyas in my office under grow lights. And a couple months ago, I got back and I had a white fly infestation. I'd never gotten white fly before. It took several tries to eradicate a lot of time in the bathtub, (laughs) drenching and showering these plants with, you know, insect sprays and systemics but we got there to my knowledge knock on wood the white flies are gone my hoya has new growth I love with hoya how the new growth tends to be pink before it turns into whatever color the plant is supposed to be that just brings me so much joy we had our first peduncle the flower sadly didn't open I was so excited to see that my Hoya Shepardi, I actually did throw off a, a peduncle, a bloom, but that was when the infestation happened. So sadly, we didn't see the blooms, but I'm happy to know that it's in that position where it feels ready to bloom for me, and I cannot wait for more blooms to come from all of my Hoya. Speaking of Hoya lovers, Jane Perone is a Hoya lover. She is a houseplant lover. I'm so excited for this conversation. When I tell you I got up at 6 a.m. the day of this interview, and I read her book cover to cover... I did. (laughs) If you know Jane, you know, I hope you do. She's an OG. She's one of the original Plant Lady podcasters. So the first two podcasts about houseplants on the market, on iTunes, on your podcast player were mine and Jane's. Hers is called On the Ledge. Jane is in England. I'm in the States. And we've kind of just been trucking along together for like five or six years. And Reading her book just brought so much joy to me because I feel like, you know, as we've been kind of the OG plant lady podcasters, it's felt very special that we both got our book opportunities at around the same time. We've both been writing around the same time. And to see Jane's book come to fruition, to get to read it, to get to just read the entire thing with a smile on my face. I got up this morning. Billy came down a couple hours into reading. He had his coffee with me. And I just kept like giggling to myself as I was reading the book. And it was so weird for him (laughs) reading this book, just giggling to myself. But it's just so rich in information. And if you love Houseplants, you'll love this book. You'll love Jane. 
and you'll love this conversation. She shares so much interesting history about the houseplants that we love that I bet you don't know. I promise you by the end of this episode, you will be walking away knowing something about your houseplants that you didn't know that will make for an incredible fun fact at a party. Maybe a party with all your plant friends, but still a fun fact. So without further ado, plant friends, let's dive right in. Jane, welcome back to Growing Joy as the author that you are now. Yes, I know. It's it's frightening. It's frightening, but it's been a while, if you may remember. So <laughs> I feel sorry for all these people who've pledged for the book, who've like, I've grown old waiting for this book to come out. So I hope it's worth the wait. I was just thinking back to when I pledged for the book. I was in my New York City apartment. So I was thinking, you know, I've moved three times since I pledged. And so I've got to go on Unbound and update my (laughs) shipping address. But I think we've all just been, I mean, I've been waiting two years to do this interview with you. We've all seen, you know, your writing journey on your social media and through your podcast. And like, I finished the book. I got up at six o'clock this morning. I read the whole book cover to cover. And my heart is just like exploding for you. It is so... (laughs) Good, Jane. It is so good. Oh, that's nice to hear. Are you proud of it? How do you feel now that you, you know, you have your beautiful cover sitting behind you? It's not this big in real life. (laughs) (laughs) This is just a poster of the Huge poster of it. I don't actually have the physical book in my hands. It's at the warehouse. It's coming to me. It's probably on a delivery van somewhere, but I don't actually have the physical copy. But yeah, I'm really excited to share this with people because... It has been such an amazing project to work on and it is really an encapsulation of my vision. My vision, not a publisher's vision, which is not always the case with books. So yeah, it kind of stands or falls on my own um, idea. So I hope everyone likes it. That's my biggest feedback for you as I was reading this book. I started reading this morning and then my husband came down because we normally have coffee on our couch together. And I was like, I can't talk to you. (laughs) I have to read this book. And I was laughing out loud as I was reading this book because so much of it is in your voice in the most incredible way. Like if you love Jane Perrone, you will love this book. If you don't love Jane Perrone, you will love this book. If you don't know who Jane Perrone is, you're going to love this book because it's so good and so thoroughly researched. But the book is so you. Like Mm -hmm. I'm proud for you of just how nerdy and eloquent and well-written and sophisticated and like all the things I think about when I describe On the Ledge podcast Mm -hmm. is exactly what I think of like after reading Legends of the Leaf. Like you just freaking knocked it out of the park. Well, I'm going to start crying here, but I'm really glad to hear that. I mean, you know, writing is my business. Just like, you know, if somebody, if you put out a song or whatever, I'd expect it to be, or, or indeed a podcast, expect it to be superb because that's your background and because writing is what I have been training to do since the very first day that I when I was about six and my name was published in the school magazine which is a photocopied set of pages and I saw my name next to a two-line review of a trip that's what I've been wanting to do so for me that's really important to me that you found the writing good. I know that you describe yourself almost as a journalist first before a podcaster or a podcaster and a journalist and a garden writer. And that really comes through. I mean, it's journalistic in its writing and that you're really sleuthing the history of these houseplants that I was just talking with Leslie Halleck this week because I'm writing this article on houseplant symbolism and lore for Farmer's Almanac. And I was saying I'm, I'm like really struggling coming up with houseplant specific history and lore there's a lot of herbal, you know, outdoor stuff, but there isn't a lot of like writing on the on specific house plants. Thank God you sent me your book. I actually used it as research <laughs> for this article because you Good. really like you really set out to it's very investigative. Like you you really set out to really go way past. I mean, the care, yeah, you have care advice for all of these plants but I like barely even read that part I was just like captivated by the first (laughs) you know couple of pages of each plant because you have history that I haven't ever heard of like ancient history about these house plants it was incredible I think that's one thing that you know a lot of house plant books that are innately practical you do get the very sort of it's very sort of skating over the surface 
place in indirect light. This comes from, you know, names a country or a continent. And that's all you get. And me being me, that was never enough. So that was part of the real joy of writing this book was kind of going into that fascinating background. And I wanted it to feel like a narrative. So in a lot of the chapters, I do have a sort of an introduction, which might seem at the beginning to be like you you think maybe think to yourself, where's this going, Jane? I don't know. Like I'm thinking of the uh, Crassula Ovasa chapter where I'm talking about Jade and Jade burial suits. It's the chapter on the jade plant, but you're not talking about the plant. You're talking about the jade mineral. Yeah, it's really a way of saying the reason why the Chinese people revere the jade plant so highly is because it resembles jade. And this is what jade means to Chinese people. And it's about there's multiple as ever with Chinese culture. There are multiple, multiple levels of understanding, but they had these burial suits where people of high standing would be buried, covered in a suit that was made of tiles of jade uh, wired with gold wire together. I mean, and they just rediscovered this. I kind of wanted to draw people in with this captivating image and make people kind of feel like they weren't reading a typical bright indirect light houseplant books. Yeah, there's plenty of those, you know. I mean, I was thinking about that, too, when I was writing my book. I'm like, go read Summer Rain's care book or Hesseon. I know you love Hesseon's yeah, Houseplant yeah, yeah. Expert if you want a care book. But how can you kind of bring a new flavor? And you did. So I'm so fascinated because the journal, like we've got, I, I'm so curious how you research this book. But before that, just let's set up the frame of yeah. what is the book and how is it structured? So as when we talk about it, our listeners understand like what we're talking about because it's a different format than other books. Yeah, so I thought about how to do this project of bringing houseplants to life via this rounded story about them, which would cover everything from how they grow in their native environment to how they've been used medicinally by indigenous people where they live to how they've been incorporated into culture and religion and and how they've been used by science. And I decided that the best way of doing that was by taking 25 iconic species picked by me so like you know sorry if your favorite plant isn't in there like it's probably a bit of a a slightly um biased list but I tried to to include plants that I believe would be instantly recognizable by the most number of people and have been important house plants in our lives and just a variety of different types of house plants and then for each one of those I just tell the story as I've just said you know all these different components coming together to tell a story about the plant and the cornerstone of that is not just to make you have cool stuff that you can tell your planty friends when you're you know in the calf with your planty friends you can say did you know which is you can do there's lots of that kind of stuff in there but also to then go okay now I understand how The Swiss cheese plant, Monstera Deliciosa, grows in the wild. And now that's helping me to understand how I can accommodate it in my home. Or now I understand how a string of pearls grows, that it doesn't grow in a massive waterfall from a shelf in nature. Now I understand that it actually grows as a mat in very shallow soil, in cracks in the soil. I'm going to treat it really differently. So that's kind of the, hopefully it leads into better plant care. Mm -hmm. Totally. And I also think as your passion for plants grows, you move past the bright and direct light. Like you want to continue learning new things about your plants. And I think as you continue to have this hobby, it gets a little bit harder to like keep it fresh. And so like learning the history is a great second step of, okay, I've got the basic bright and direct light, direct light, watering, terracotta pots, whatever down. So let's go into this next historical thing, which will actually fuel the care, which I thought was really cool. So what blew me away was all of the different sources that you had in this book. How did you (laughs) go about researching this? This It's a really good question. I used a lot of different resources. I read an awful lot of books. I used a lot of um, places where you can search through academic papers to find mentions of plants and reference those. I used something called the 
Biodiversity Heritage Library, I hope I've got that name right, which has got this amazing archive of everything from seed catalogues to scientific accounts of plants, which goes back a really long way. And I also looked at newspaper archives as well. That was, I mean, do I love having a subscription to newspaper archives? I did thoroughly enjoy that side of it. So looking up, you know, when can I find mentions of these various plants back in newspaper gardening columns from the 1950s or from the 18th century. And so that was really interesting. I talked to some botanists to make sure I was getting along the right lines about certain things. So there is a degree of botany in there. And I hope that I've got as much of that right as possible. So there are some interesting stories like the fiddle leaf fig. It was one where I had to talk to a botanist called uh, Dr. Scott Zona because uh, I needed to understand what's going on with a fig because a fig is a weird thing, right? It's not really a fruit. It's I, I think he described it as a bunch of flowers turned inside out. And there's this amazing relationship between figs and their pollinators, which are usually, well, in the case of the fiddle leaf fig is a tiny wasp called Agaean spatulatum, I think it's called. And it's the one wasp that makes the plant produce figs. Now, probably we wouldn't even think of the fiddle leaf fig producing figs, but it does. But it won't get anywhere unless you happen to be in the plant's native range because you don't have this wasp. So that's why fiddle leaf figs, although you get them in places like Hawaii, they're not an invasive species because that wasp does not exist there. So just stuff like that, that you can get into. And by talking to scientists who were studying these plants at various levels, I gained loads of interesting information. And just amazing how much stuff we still don't really know. That was the other thing. Probably you found there are a lot of places where I go, we don't really know why that's happening. But here's a few ideas. Yeah. What was the one where you were like, everybody talks about how aloe is Cleopatra's skincare routine, but there's like no historical evidence of it. A lot of these things that you read on the internet that's been kind of spread around and you try to go back to the source material on that and you're like, well, yeah, maybe, maybe not. I mean, the classic one on that was the Begonia maculata, where you can read about in many sources that the red undersides of the leaves were the inspiration. This polka dot begonia with the green leaves with the white with the silvery marks and then the red undersides. That was the inspiration for the famous shoe, red soled shoe of Christian Le Boutin. Now, could I find anywhere that actually can conf- a source material for that? No, there's no source material that I found that confirmed that. But it's frequently repeated on the internet. And um, so just trying to get beyond some of these ideas that are, are wrong and bring some some other things forward that perhaps people wouldn't be aware of. Just stuff that blew my mind. I was in awe of some of these plants and the amazing stories behind them, both on a botanical level and just culturally as well. Similarly, like the whole plants clean the air thing, which you referenced in a couple of your articles, like this whole concept that plants clean the air. But yeah, they kind of do, but not really. If you have a ventilated home and room, this is totally off the cuff, but I've been on a couple of interviews lately where the people that I'm talking to are like, well, we know plants clean the air, blah, blah, blah. And sometimes I like don't even have the heart to tell them. Like, do you tend to dispel the the myth or sometimes (laughs) do you just let it glaze over? There's a cartoon about this. I can't think of the exact wording, but, you know, life is usually more comp like the facts are usually way more complicated. Like life is really complicated. And in most cases, there's a really complex story going on. And this is the case with plants cleaning the air. And, you know, however many listicles you read, you're not going to really get to the bottom of it in that route. You know, me having my uh, baby Swiss cheese plant on the floor down here, this is making negligible impact on the air. Yes, plants can remove volatile organic compounds from the air, things like formaldehyde, and they can have an impact. But it's a question of scale. And like if you want to improve your air quality, the things you need to do are stop using a wood burning stove, stop using a gas stove, open your windows, stop burning candles and using air freshener. And all of those kind of things. Those are the things that are going to make the difference. Yes, there is a potential in the future for 
um, science to come up with ways that we can harness plants more powerfully. So you're getting things like green walls now that actually have the air pushed through them to enhance the air cleaning qualities of the plants. But yeah, just that spider plant sat on the side is not going to make any difference, really a negligible difference to anything. But that doesn't mean that we shouldn't recognise the amazing biophilic powers of plants which are huge and so just having plants around you can make you feel good but not necessarily because of the amount of formaldehyde they're getting rid of on an episode dedicated to houseplant history we've got to talk about the best way to set your plants up for success which is potting them in a high quality organic potting mix and treating them with amazing fertilizers If you don't already know, Espoma Organic is a 90-year-old family-owned and operated company dedicated to making safe indoor and outdoor gardening products for people, pets, and the planet. So I now use Espoma's products both indoors and outdoors, but I got to know Espoma through my houseplant collection. The first product of theirs I ever got was a bottle of their liquid indoor houseplant food. Summerine Oaks gifted it to me, and it was awesome. I was intimidated to fertilize my houseplants before them because I didn't like the measuring, the mess, halving the dosage for outdoor fertilizer for houseplant fertilizer. But the beauty of this fertilizer is it's created for houseplants. You don't have to like half anything. The the science, the math is already done for you. All you have to do is pour the liquid fertilizer directly into your houseplant watering can and then water your plants. That's easy. And then for houseplants, I love the general Espoma potting mix for most of my houseplants. If I have aeroids that want a little bit more of a specialized chunky mix or if I'm just in a mood where I want to like feel like I'm making my own potting mix, I'll mix some of their orchid mix into their general potting mix to just fluff it up a little bit. But they also have specific potting mixes for almost any plant that you're going to have, whether it's succulents, cacti, African violets, bonsai. And you know, that succulent cacti mix is also a citrus mix, so I used to pot limey my lime tree in it. I can't recommend the potting soils and the fertilizers enough. I also love their organic insect sprays that I've used to treat my white flies and other pest outbreaks that I've had. And to top it all off, they have a huge sustainability commitment, 100% solar-powered plant, zero-waste manufacturing, and eco-friendly packaging. They're the best. I love them. To learn more about their indoor and outdoor products, visit espoma.com to see where your local Espoma dealers are. Or click the link in the show notes to go to my Amazon storefront where I have a curated list of my Espoma favorites. All right, plant friends, last call for ordering your transplants from Territorial Seed Company if you want a growing garden with not too much work this year. (laughs) If you weren't able to start your seeds this year, but you want to grow an effortless garden, try Territorial Seed Company's extended line of flower and vegetable transplants. That's what I'm going to be doing this year because I had three weeks of travel in the seed starting season, so I wasn't able to start from seed and babysit them the way I needed to. So all I did was went online and I ordered the Territorial Seed Transplants They're going to get delivered directly to my door and then I'm just going to plop them in the grow bags that I already have set up on my balcony and just go live my best dang life. I also love that all of their vegetable transplants are being grown in larger pots with 50% more organic soil mix because, you know, when you go to a garden center and you buy a little transplant seedling, you really never know what chemicals they're pumping through that soil for those edible plants. And I want to make sure they're organic. So last chance because those ship out late May. And if you do want to get your hands dirty and direct so, there is still time. So if you are in the Northern Hemisphere, this is general, but beans, squash, melons, and corn are great warm weather crops, perfect for planting in the month of May. For the procrastinator gardeners out there, no judgment, obviously. You can get your carrots in the ground, and you can also start your lettuce and spinach outdoors before it gets too hot. And if you want to grow leeks, you can start your transplants indoors ASAP now in order to transplant them in a few weeks. For these seeds, for the transplants, for whatever gardening supplies you need, visit TerritorialSeed.com slash GrowingJoy for a 10% off discount on all Territorial Seed items. All you have to do to get the discount is to go to TerritorialSeed.com slash GrowingJoy and 10% off will be applied at checkout. Once again, that's TerritorialSeed.com slash GrowingJoy. You've agreed to give us a bit of a history lesson. So I read your whole book. You've got 25 species. We'll do maybe five. But a plant that I have not paid attention to at all in my personal collection, but I loved your chapter on Aphidistra, which was also your opening chapter. 
here it is look it's on i mean i'm just going to show you this cover here there we go uh the aspidistra's there on the front yeah it's a really key plant in british culture in many ways so this is a plant that has been culturally quite a significant symbol so in 1932 if you looked in the um, Times newspaper, famous Times of London newspaper, back then they had the small ads on the front, right? That was how papers looked. There were just a load of small ads on the front page. And you, if you'd have looked carefully under the section for guest houses and things, you'd have looked for one guest house which had a description of its lovely hot water, which at the time was obviously an exciting development. But at the end of that ad for this South Coast boarding house, um, it said in big capital letters, no aspidistras. Now, to us now, that seems like, what are they talking about? But back then, aspidistras were such a symbol of sort of Victorian propriety that they became a bit of a butt of a joke, really. And that was kind of summarised in George Orwell's book, Keep the Aspidistra Flying, which, funnily enough, was a... When I was starting my podcast six years ago, I thought of that for a title, and then I realised that not everyone had done an English degree like me and that lots of people had never heard of Keep the Aspidistra Flying. (laughs) Plus, also, like, it's not a symbol that you want to imbue because... As I say, it was basically a symbol of a, a past time, a past English sensibility, which we were moving away from. But this was in a song by Gracie Fields called The Biggest Aspidistra in the World, which was um, a, this ridiculous song about this huge, enormous aspidistra. I think it was a, a big a transmitter, radio transmitter in World War Two that was called Aspidistra because it was enormous, named after this song. So there's all this kind of power of this symbol of the aspidistra and it's kind of strange because even though it went out of fashion people were still growing this plant and it's one of those plants that we have seen passed down from family to family and you know the, despite the fact that it's actually a japanese plant and it's a really good house plant because it is an indoor outdoor plant it's really hardy outside it can go down to minus 10 centigrade i don't know what that is fahrenheit cold anyway and it's also got an incredible role in flower arranging, Japanese flower arranging, ikebana. The leaves are either left-handed or right-handed, which means the way that they're arranged, the ribs are arranged. And I think the left-handed ones are less common than the right-handed ones, but it affects what you can do with them. So there's all these different reasons to find aspidistras fascinating. And they have really, in the UK, even now, if you said aspidistra to people... It would summon up this picture of like neck curtains and a doily and a jardiniere right. and an aspidistra. But also, of course, like all good things from the UK, we exported it to America and it became known as the barroom plant there because people had them in a bar because they were super tough and they didn't mm-hmm. die. And people would have them planted in spittoons and things like that. And in Germany, it was called cobbler's palm because you know you'd have it in a cobbler's shop because it was tough so there's all these different links culturally and it's just it's now back in fashion and everyone's growing it and loving it and we've seen it in a totally new light and we want to embrace its elegant looks and things but throughout history it's had these many incarnations so I just love it as a house plant I think it's it's a fantastic one and I think The only reason why it isn't more popular than it is is because it's still quite expensive to buy because it's quite slow growing. So if you've got a bit of patience, get an Aspidistra. Have you watched Enola Holmes on Netflix? No, my children have, but I haven't. Oh, watch it for the plants. Enola's home is filled with, it's a very Victorian-esque, like, gorgeous houseplants, lots of Aspidistras. Now, am I remembering correctly that that's also the plant that could tolerate the gas lights. Yeah, that's the other reason why it was just massive in Victorian homes is that it can withstand ethylene, which has been given off by all these gas lights. And ethylene is the same thing that your bananas are putting out, right? So when plants are hit with a ton of ethylene, they are affected really badly and eventually die. But but for some reason, aspidistras can withstand that. So that's one of the reasons why they were so popular. And that's the reason why Victorians were putting stuff in glass cases, because they had this massive, massive air pollution problem that we don't have today. And they were also just so really cold tolerant. 
Yeah, and like they were breathing. I mean, the humans were breathing that we're going to put our plants in glass, but we're just going to breathe. It's, I mean, it's interesting. It's like... I'm not nostalgic for the past. I re- I mean, I'd love to go in a time machine and go back to visit these places, but I am not nostalgic for that past when it was freezing cold, apart unless you were right by the fire. And uh, yeah, your, the air's laced with God knows what, as is the food. <laughs> totally. Oh my gosh, 100%. I like looking back at photos. The you know those glass houses were nice, but uh, n- no interest. Happy to stay here. It's also I just another you know off the cuff thing, but it is funny where you know I live in the woods where it's like fourteen percent humidity, and it's funny it's the plants and it's my bird that has me running my humidifier, not my body, not my like very dry skin and everything. But it is interesting how people will you know will take measures for their plants and pets before they do themselves. Absolutely. I loved this quote from your book. You called the spider plant the living wallpaper to our lives. Yeah. I loved that. Please tell us the history of the spider plant. Well, I mean, the living wallpaper thing, one of my early houseplant encounters was being led out of maths lesson with my friend Ruth Watson. Shout out to Ruth Watson. Shout out. Uh, (laughs) Ruth Watson and I used to go and water the spider plants in the school library. So, so everybody had spider plants. Like they were just everybody. Nobody didn't have a spider plant. It was just something you had in your house. I mean, in many ways today, that's probably still true, which is kind of curious for this plant, the continent, continent of Africa, which is, you know, in the wild, it's not really the plant that we imagine in our homes. You know, it grows terrestrially. It's not a, it's not an epiphyte. It doesn't grow up in a tree. And those variegated forms that we are see as the standard, those are just mutations. They're not what the plant looks like in the wild. But it's got a bit of a celeb input in that Goethe, the German poet, was was a massive fan of spider plants, and he he was sent one. And you sometimes find in old accounts it being called Goethe's plant. And I had to get somebody to translate some German for me so I could find out more about this connection. But he was really mad on the the spider plant. He seemed to like plants like this that you could multiply and give away. Um, So he was also mad on the Calanco mother of thousands with the tiny leaflets. That's also sometimes known as Goethe's plant. So um, he was really into that plant. I loved that it was a symbol of fertility. Yeah, there's a lot of that in indigenous culture where it grows in the wild, but also in modern witchery, it seems to be considered a fertility symbol. So people would put it in rooms to encourage a fertile state. So that was really interesting to learn about that. I think it's one of those plants that's very underrated, like the Aspidistra. It's just, it's there in the background. We don't really think about it, but actually... I think if you can grow that plant well, it is one of the most stunning house plants you can grow. You can grow them to be so dramatic and so huge. They're beautiful. So that's a re- another reason to, to treat it well rather than neglecting it like the ones in my school library. <laughs> yeah. I had a listener once tell a story that they had a spider plant pup that was like given to them at school And they kept it in their backpack that like got shoved in a closet. And like two months later, they found the backpack and the plant, the plantlet was alive. Like it's such, if you want to talk about hardy plants, you know, it's interesting. I, um, I've never cared for that plant. I've never had one, but I just like, I didn't, I don't love the aesthetic of it. Like with all the pups, but after reading that chapter, I was like, huh, I think maybe I'll, you know, as we start family planning, I'm like, maybe I will hang one in my bedroom. (laughs) You never know. You never know. They come in so many varieties too. And it is, it's like, I love just that concept of the the living wallpaper because it's a tried and true plant. Mm -hmm. And I feel like, I think you and I both have collections of houseplant care books from like the 60s and 70s. And there's a reason why the Aspidistra and the spider plant they're in all of those books too. It's like those plants don't go out of style because they're great house plants. And I think there's a reason mm-hmm. for that. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. That's very true. They're, they're never going to stop being popular. I mean, I, the one I've got right now is actually a plain green one. I do like the plain green ones. And I'm trying to train it up to be really enormous. So it's like an enormous, by the time I'm, you know, retired, it's going to be this beast. <laughs> This almost beat, like beat. six foot tall. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. I love that. 
Question for you, plant friend. What's holding you back from growing your own food? Are you nervous about not having enough space? Maybe it's a time management thing. Are maybe your growing conditions a little questionable? Do you have a bare bones budget? Container gardening is a great place to start if any of these are something you're struggling with. With a minimal investment in time, money, and space, and a new book called The First Time Gardener, Container Food Gardening at your side, you can easily and affordably start your very first garden in containers instead of in the ground. Plant friend, you just may find your capable of growing fantastic yields in spite of all of your initial hesitations. I've personally gardened in containers and grow bags on various different balconies that I've had for many years and I literally grow a full summer of salads. I don't buy greens from the grocery store in the summer and of course I've got vegetables and tomatoes growing as well. But there are basics that you need to know if you are a garden newbie and you want to try it for the first time and do it well. A great resource that you could try reading as you embark on your gardening journey is a new book called The First Time Gardener, Container Food Gardening by Pam Farley. This book is filled with everything a beginner gardener needs to know, like what size container you need for each different vegetable you're growing, when to fertilize and how often to water, where to locate your container garden, and most importantly, what to do if and when problems arise and how to fix them. Plus, in the book, Pam has dozens of fully illustrated planting plans for themed container food gardens, like a smoothie greens garden, a spring stir fry garden, a spaghetti sauce garden, a salad greens garden, and many others. It's so adorable. So what are you waiting for? plan friends start small and just get growing with the book the first time gardener container food gardening pick it up at your favorite local bookstore bookshop.org barnes and noble or amazon.com once again the book is called first time gardener container food gardening by pam farley and you can find it wherever books are sold first time gardener container food gardening by pam farley Okay, so I am always on the hunt for new podcasts to listen to, and I figured if you're listening to this podcast, you might be too. So if you're looking for another show that nourishes your soul, then you have to check out No Small Endeavor, produced by my friends at Great Feeling Studios and PRX. No Small Endeavor explores what it means to live meaningfully just like this show. In each episode, award-winning professor and host Lee C. Camp brings you thoughtful conversations with artists, philosophers, and theologians like The Office actor Rain Wilson and West Wing's Michael Sheen about what it means to truly flourish. If you need a place to start, I highly recommend their recent episode with New York Times bestselling author Gretchen Rubin. The conversation is all about what it takes to be happy day by day. So go ahead, plant friend. Go follow No Small Endeavor on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts and tell them I sent you. That's no small endeavor. I really appreciated in the beginning of your book how you talked about colonial botany. And before we dive into Diffenbachia, which I think is a very important history and story to tell, I would love for you to kind of explain colonial botany and why it was so important for you to start your book. I mean, in the intro. I mean, I felt a lot of weight of responsibility, to be honest, trying to make sure that the book wasn't just following the normal tropes about, oh, these amazing, brave plant hunters who went out around the world and found, they found, they discovered all these amazing plants. Well, yeah, that's one narrative, but there's another narrative here, which is there were indigenous people using those very plants living with them well before western people came along it was an economic exercise right they were looking for plants to make money and they didn't have a huge amount of regard for (laughs) for the people who were helping them so all of these plant hunters they didn't just go in there and grab the plants they had to be bankrolled by people and also they had to use indigenous people to find these plants and keep them safe and find the locations and a lot of indigenous people died doing that i think probably the most dramatic one is in the chinese money plant chapter where i talk about george forrest and his trip to yunnan province where i mean it's heartbreaking he i can't remember how many he had in his party what the actual number was but he had around 20 people in his party who were all indigenous people and he went at a time when there was a huge uprising again caused by the british which he basically had to flee with his retinue 
And there were women just throwing themselves in the river to kill themselves because they knew if they were going to get caught, they would be raped and killed, basically. And they were the people who he had sort of employed to help him. And he just about managed to escape with his life. And he went back the next year. That's the amazing thing of all, that he went back the next year to do it all again. Um, but we never hear the stories of those people. What did they think about? this plant what did they think about this guy coming along and trying to find plant specimens those stories remain very hidden and are very hard to access so I did my best to try to bring those stories to weave those stories into the narrative because to me they are just as important if not more important than the whole plant hunter brave plant hunter trope that we hear so often Totally. You had a line in your book saying, you know, we remember the white male plant hunters names, but we don't remember any or we're not taught any of the names of the indigenous people that helped them. And I do think that is a little sad, obviously sad for the historical, but, you know, we still have plant poaching. We still have, this is kind of still an issue. Absolutely. In 2023 is just like unbelievable. And that brings us to Diffenbachia. Yeah, yeah. Another thing that your book really helped open my eyes to, the misogyny in the name Mother-in-Law's Oh, tongue. you like that one. Yes. You know, I mean, well, I... <laughs> it didn't occur to me. And as a female, right? Like, I don't know. I'm going through this period where I'm just realizing how much society has just like brainwashed me and made me realize... You're having your feminist awakening. I'm liking yes, this. Yes, I'm having my feminist <laughs> awakening. And I was just like, holy shit, that's really fucking misogynist part of my language but yeah yeah and there are a couple of plants with that name so can you just speak a little bit to the misogyny there too i have always avoided the name mother-in-law's tongue when i say this to people and when i said to my publishers and i've and for example i told the rhs please can you i was writing an article about sansevieria and i said please please do not use this word and this is why and to be fair, they did listen, but a lot of the time I get completely blank looks. Now, I know that there have been sort of similar discussions with things like Tradescantia being renamed Wandering Dude, again, for reasons that are totally valid. But people often just don't, or they think it's a joke that, oh, yeah, mother-in-laws. Well, yes. I always say, well, I really like my mother-in-law and I don't think we really need to be tarring all mother-in-laws with this idea of how, I mean, it's just misogyny writ large so that was really important to me and I tell this story in the book which I found in quite a few American newspapers about this casual misogyny going on in the world of plant naming and yeah so I've tried to sort of highlight that and I hope that people will not use that term anymore. In my app in my community we have a list of plant names that you're not allowed to use and we have like a two or three you know, you get a notification if you use it accidentally because there's a lot of education that's involved. But yeah, we have like those names are off limits because we have to train ourselves out of it because those books in the 60s and 70s that we love are like riddled with all <laughs> oh of these gosh, I know. very insensitive names. We arrive at the Diffenbachia, yeah. which has a very sad history, yeah. uh, a dark history. So let's learn about it. It's an interesting one. I... I wonder whether I got completely to the bottom of it all. But the leopard lily, as I call it in the book, the other name that it has is dumb cane. Again, I don't use that term because the reason why it's called dumb cane is because it was used as a punishment for slaves in plantations. Now, this is hard to, to know if you've only ever seen this as a house plant. But when this plant grows in the wild, it grows into big canes, which look a bit like sugar canes or bamboo canes. And in fact, I think people have mistaken it for sugarcane and damaged themselves as a result because it contains this very toxic substance which makes your mouth swell up. And so it was used as a punishment for unruly slaves. Slave owners would make people eat this stuff and it would make their mouth swell up and their throat swell up so they couldn't speak. It didn't usually kill people. I guess the sad reality was economically you didn't actually want to kill your slave. You just wanted to punish them. And so they were punished with this awful punishment of being given this cane and the result being they could no longer speak. It blew their whole face up and mouth up. So that was one aspect of it, which is horrific. And as I say, that's why I don't use the term dumb cane, because I mean, I, it's, it's tricky, uh, but I feel like that's kind of slightly glorifying its past use which is obviously horrific 
that's one thing. It was also used as an aid for sterility. So people who were worried about getting pregnant would take it as well. Again, that's a bit of a, there's a lot of um, different academic papers and stuff about how it was used, but there's certainly a lot of literature about its use in that way. Then we get to the Nazis. <laughs> Let's get the Nazis involved here. Why not? So at the time when the Nazis were, were rising to power, in the 30s, there were these German doctors and they realised that Diefenbakia extracts could be used as a method for sterilising rats. And when the Nazis learn about this, that, that kind of turned on a bit of a light bulb for them because they were looking for ways of sterilising men in concentration camps. I mean, I think I describe it in the book as a kind of slow genocide because they wanted to to sterilise people, but surgical castration was more time consuming and expensive to do. So horrifically, they were looking at ways of mass sterilising people and they found this method from these German doctors and they started to grow Diefenbakia to try to raise up enough of this plant to make this possible. Now, again, records were destroyed after the war, so it's difficult to know exactly, but in the documentation that we do have, there is an indication that they did actually get to the stage of growing this plant, but it wasn't ever fully put into place. I'm sure, they would have tried it on some prisoners, but it wasn't a mass program as they envisaged it. I think partly there's different explanations as to why, partly because either the greenhouses were bombed or it just was too expensive to keep the greenhouses heated in a time of war growing Diefenbakia, as we know, which is a tropical plant. So, yeah, it's pretty dark. It's pretty dark. I mean, um, I quote my favourite of all houseplant blogger who says, you know, you think you know this plant and then you discover all this stuff and you're like, I don't even know who you are anymore. And it's true. It's just you just never picture that this plant's going to have such a dark past. It's still a popular house plant and it's sold by the million and a lot of people have it in their homes and don't realise the potential danger from allowing pets to nibble on it or whatever. It's probably not going to kill you because it tastes revolting. So you're only going to let a little bit of it touch your lips before you spit it out. But it does have a very dark history. Yeah. But also good for people with pets to know, because that's definitely whatever that thing is. It's also in Monstera. I mean, that's, yeah. that's the toxic thing for pets. Yeah, so absolutely. It's, it's... And, you know, there are cases where particularly, and I'm sure it's the same with pets, with small children, where sometimes small children's taste buds are not the same as adults' taste buds. And they can withstand a lot more bitterness than we'd expect. So, yeah, there is a potential risk. And it's one of those plants that you need to be a little bit careful of if you're handling it a lot with bare hands not just touching it but if you're pruning it that's can it's best to wear gloves when you're dealing with it in that way okay let's take a turn to something a little bit more positive i enjoyed the boston fern chapter and how the boston fern that we know is actually maybe from philadelphia <laughs> or maybe should better be called philadelphia yeah. can you share that historical tidbit the wonderful thing about the Boston fern is that it's a cultivar of this sword fern which is an amazing plant because it is very um what's the right word probably a botanist would have a good term for this but it can undergo a lot of mutations and that's how the Boston fern uh Nephrolepis exaltata bostoniensis came about it was just a chance mutation that was discovered in a glass house where at the time the, you know, as you know, the Victorians were crazy for ferns. They've been crazy for ferns for like more than 50 years. And they're still crazy for ferns as the 18th century was coming to a close. OK, so this is 1894. And this guy called Fred Becker, he's um, a florist in Cambridge, Massachusetts. And he gets this order of sword ferns from a, another guy from Philadelphia. And he notices that there's some ferns that are different, that look different. And those are the Boston ferns. That's how it all starts. And people went crazy for these Boston ferns and then people discovered all these further mutations and that's why there's just so many different variations on the theme out there. But yeah, they were just, I mean, the millions and millions of those ferns produced at the time, you cannot imagine how popular that plant was. I mean, there's this great quote from an advert that I found from a grower called W.M. Lott and he wrote, to see the Boston fern is to want it. To want it is to possess it because the price tag is so reasonable. Now, like for all the people with their wish list of aroids, that sounded like really familiar, like 
to see it is to want it. To want it is to possess it. People couldn't just click a button on a phone, but they could, you know, see that advert in the newspaper and go to their florist and buy these plants. It was just an absolute hit and it became known as the Boston Fern and it's become a plant that is still today absolutely beloved. But I think maybe particularly in American homes, particularly Southern American homes, I think, where you can have it more outside. Oh yeah, on a porch. The hanging planter Mm. of a Boston Fern is a very Southern thing. I had a Boston Fern when I was in New York City. Don't have it now. I did cut it loose a couple years ago but I did find that for ferns it is hardier than other ferns and even when I would neglect it and let it get crispy if I cut it back it would grow back it's a very resilient plant and I feel like for the fern family if you want to try ferns but maybe you're not as mindful of plant parent as you need to be to really have ferns thrive it's a great option yeah Also, there's an American TV show, I don't know if you've ever seen it, in the UK called Will and Grace. Have you ever Mm -hmm. seen it? And I was re-watching it the other day. You know, I grew up watching that show, and I came back to it, and uh, there is the most epic Boston fern in Will and Grace's living room. And it is, I'm talking 12 to 24 inches. I mean, it's huge and lush. And I was just like, I want to know the history of that fern, because it looks real. And so I'm like, what offstage antics were happening how many ferns was that plant really like how many ferns got cycled through on that set it's a really lovely plant and if you can make it happy it will be a real stalwart in your home and you're right it can revive itself it's not as finicky as some of the other ferns i think the main thing is it's quite messy it's quite a messy plant yeah it's gonna drop a little dust buster yeah you do and that that is an issue which you have to kind of be be aware of and i think also it's one of those plants that it's not the kind of plant where you will get by with it if you're the kind of person who just dribbles a bit out the watering can every now and again you need to commit if you've got a big boston fern to right i'm gonna dunk this sucker every two weeks and i'm gonna soak it really well because that's what they really need is because their root balls get huge and you can't penetrate them with small amounts of water so you've got to be on point with watering really for that one they've been a real mainstay i think particularly in the american foliage plant market um, for many years and particularly in that time sort of 1894 or whatever it was till the sort of 1920s it was just huge absolutely huge Do you have a favorite plant after doing all of this research that surprised you the most or fascinated you the most? I think the the Diefenbakia chapter was pretty, pretty surprising. I think in terms of plants that I like, it's really hard. It's like there's 25 plants in here. I'm like, oh, I would say the plant that's most deeply embedded in my consciousness is definitely my Swiss cheese plant. I mean, you know, you can't really see any further than that which is why i'm trying to get the unicode to make a um emoji of the monster i know how's the update what's the update on that the update on that (laughs) is i've been totally ridiculous in that i had to have had a big fanfare and then i just left it for a long time didn't have time to work on it and then last year by the time i realized that i needed to get on with it i'd missed the window unicode is a very they've got very strict rules you have to apply You have to put in your proposal on very specific dates and I'd missed the boat. So the window opens at the beginning of April. So I'm basically nearly there with my proposal. So that's going to go into Unicode and I'm hoping they will listen and make it a a monster emoji because this plant is like, this is the iconic This is the iconic. This is it. It is the plant. It is the plant. Like I think if you did a survey of people around the world, Even if people didn't know what it was called, they would be able to say, yeah, I recognize that plant. I've seen that before because it's just got these incredible split and and holy leaves, which just everyone loves. Yeah, totally. I'm not a believer of a starter plant for everyone, but I do feel like every plant collector should have a Monstera just because they're versatile. They're hardy. You know, they're really hardy, like for how fancy they are. And they just fill a space so beautifully. They just immediately bring those jungle vibes. People get very worried about this plant. You know, I see, I saw this throughout 
the time they've been cultivated, people are terrified of cutting this plant back. In the 1950s, in you know newspaper plant columns, you'd get people saying, my monster has come to the ceiling and I don't know what to do now. And it's still the case today that people are worried about cutting this plant back. But it's actually the reason why it works as a house plant is because in nature, it's used to that happening to it. That's the entire reason why when it grows up trees, it produces this incredible network of roots coming out of the stem, which both anchor it to the tree. Well, some of the roots anchor it to the tree and some of them reach to the ground to act as feeder roots because it's prepared for a scenario. Like the scenario is the plant is either going to get eaten by something. So it's going to, the stem is going to be broken. Does the plant die? No, because it's got all these feeder roots above that still connect it to the ground or Mm -hmm. you know, the tree that it's on breaks down and it gets, again, it gets split. No worries. The plant's going to keep going. So the plant is totally ready for this scenario. So that's what we have to bear in mind when we get afraid of chopping it. Totally. Chop that guy back. And also, <laughs> everybody wants a Monstera. Chop and prop and gift it to your friends. Absolutely. Or... My first Monstera I got was a three-leafed juvenile cutting that I kept growing. I kept chopping and propping it and building up the pot. It's a 10-inch pot Monstera now. It's enormous and it has fenestrated leaves and, you know, it's incredible. I mean, it's just like also a very simple way to like affordably grow, if you have the patience, to grow big plants. Speaking of the visuals, the illustrations in your book are so awesome, so vibrant. The colors are so vibrant. How did you choose your illustrator and what was it like working with her? Well, it was a really good experience. I think maybe echoes your own experience with your illustrator. Now, uh, publishing generally, oftentimes as a writer, you don't get much control over the illustrations you know you're doing the words and somebody else is doing the illustrations and you might not have any contact with that other person or much interaction with them that was not the case for this book partly because the way I published it through Unbound they gave me a lot of editorial controls so from the beginning I had this vision and I was allowed to make that vision happen so I looked at two or three illustrators. Really, I always had Helen Entwistle in mind because she reminded me the other day of how we first connected. It was when I was working at The Guardian and she's a printmaker. She does printmaking and lino cuts and things. And she'd made these seed envelopes and that was how we first connected. And I'd been following what she does. And she and I share a love of a 50s mid-century aesthetic. So I immediately thought of her because I didn't want to go down the botanical illustration route I didn't want them to look like any other plant book I wanted them to be accurate but still look fresh so that was what I was aiming for I hope I've achieved it I think she's done a fantastic job so we worked together on it and I sent we had a constant communication I mean she was on deadline she was on deadline deadline because she was pregnant and she had to get it done before she went off to have her baby so she was really working to a deadline and she I would send her illustration a photographs of saying well this is the kind of thing we're looking for and then she would come back to me and we went back and forth and I just love the way the illustrations have turned out and the other thing just to mention which people might be interested to know is that each of those pots so the plants are pictured in pots and each of those pots I think barring one is an actual pot that either her or I own cool I love that we made it like so like the pot that gets the aloe vera is in a any China people out there will recognize this name is in a Bitossi vase that I have, which I actually use as a tooth mug, which will probably, oh, actually, no, it's not a tooth mug. I've got it. Have I got it here? It was a tooth mug. I think I've moved it now, which I absolutely love. So there's a few kind of classic mid-century designs in there, which probably most people, it'll pass them by. But if it makes one China person a little bit excited, then I'll be happy with that. I love that. They're so joyful. Is she going to sell the prints? I don't know whether that will happen. Certainly for the crowdfunder, you can buy a book of the of postcards of all the prints. And she does have the original screen prints. But I'm not sure about that, actually, whether under her contract, what she's allowed to do with them. But I think they're stunning. I mean, gosh, I would love to have them on my wall. Yeah, like a gallery wall of all those prints would look yeah. so cool. Especially postcards to get the little frames and do 20 of those prints would look so cool. 
It's a beautiful book. Where can everyone find it, whether you're in the UK or whether you're in the States? Because it's going to be a different set up so tell us both ways you can go to the unbound website and find it there and that links on my website if you're in the uk or europe i think it's going to be pretty easy to get hold of it's on amazon.co.uk and i've seen it's on various european book selling websites and it's also available in other uk places like bookshop.org and hive dot org um, which are kind of um, hive.org is a sort of a one for that supports independent bookstores so there's various ways of getting hold of it in the us it's not quite so easy you can get the ebook on amazon.com i'm hoping it's going to be distributed in the us but it isn't right now you can still go into your local bookshop or phone them up and request a copy and they should be able to order it in for you but not available as a hard copy book on amazon.com as it it stands unfortunately but i'm hoping that'll change and i hope someone starts a petition to your publisher to get it in the states because i just think that's ridiculous but yeah so american listeners go support jane and demand the book in your local bookshop so her publisher can get the memo and distribute it out here because it's such a good book and it's unlike anything I've ever read and it would be so great on anyone's bookshelf if you're a nerd like you or me and have a collection of plant books. I have two shelves of plant books now. It's like my husband is gonna like put me on pause. I mean my office I've got two sets of Billy bookcases here and they are literally full of plant and well, not all house plants i'd say about a third of them are house plants and the rest are gardening books it's a lifelong obsession i'd be interested to know were there any things in the book that you read it and you thought gosh i haven't really thought about this plant before but now i want to give this plant a try was there anything you were kind of converted to by reading about it feel free to say no definitely the spider plant like i definitely think come spring i'll get a spider plant and I actually really loved your chapter on aloe vera. I had aloe vera and then I overwatered it and it turned to mush. But I was thinking that I'll definitely add an aloe vera back to my kitchen windowsill because the medicinal practice, but the history of it, and it's another just like tried and true houseplant that everybody has. And I think in your book, you said, you know, if you don't have one, ask around because someone's going to be able to just give you a pup. Like you don't need to buy one. Everybody's got one. I really liked that and I was tickled. You know, it's not a plant that I'm particularly drawn to, but I know it's one of your favorites. The strawberry. <laughs> I know. I was tickled at that chapter because I know that's your, like that's one of your main plants that you're just like, this should be in the common thing. So I haven't tried that maybe when we move, if I get a little bit more space, but I would say definitely it really opened my eyes to the spider plant in a different way. But I also feel like it just gave me a deeper appreciation for my fiddly fig, which I hadn't even considered what the fruit would look like. I also thought it was interesting, your chapters on the strings. So the strings of hearts and the strings of pearls. I thought that was interesting because I think you educated a lot about where they come from in nature mm -hmm. and I think sometimes we understand with monsteras they climb on trees but I think with the strings particularly it was interesting to read about them because in the houseplant world you know we stake monsteras we know that they climb up trees but the fact that we're using strings of hearts and strings of pearls as hanging baskets where like you said earlier in the interview string of pearls actually climb and they're like a almost not like a moss, but they're like a floor. A kind scrambler. Of uh, yeah. A scrambler. Yeah. I thought that was super interesting. So yeah, I feel like I just have a deeper appreciation for all 25 of the plants, but I'll tag you on Instagram when I add a spider plant to my, yes. to my collection. Yes, absolutely. Well, my son has already come up. I mean, you know, anyone who writes a book will say like childbirth will say never again, but my son has already come up with titles for the sequels books two and three secrets of the stem is his title for book two another 25 <sighs> iconic house plants and then we have book three i'm not really going to do this i should just say but book three would be a flowering house plant one folklore of the flowers so there you go he's come up with titles for oh me already my God. bless him well actually i'm <laughs> doing another are you interviewing noel kingsbury no 
he just came out with a good book. Oh, yes, he has. That's right. I just the saw The Story that. of Flowers. I just saw that yeah. the other day. Yeah, he's a really interesting guy. And I just saw that book, actually. Yes, so he's already written that book. But there you go. Gorgeous. <laughs> but yeah, it could be in a similar vein. But it's a very... If you were to do it with your riff and with your illustrator, it would be a very different book than his book, which is very kind of formal. Yeah, I love it. Oh, my gosh. So are you thinking of writing another book? Me neither, girl. I'm like, no. No. <laughs> no. no. In, I've seen a couple of my author friends have gotten their second book deals in the last couple of months. And it's made me be like, shoot, is this something I'm mm-hmm. supposed to be thinking about? And I'm like, no. I don't think people understand <laughs> the process. I mean, you've gone through childbirth. So what do you feel like? How? What do you feel like when authors say it's like yeah. a book baby? <laughs> There's a similarity in that, you you know, the pain lessens over time and you get used to it. I mean, I think the thing about writing a book is that when you get to this stage of the, oh, let's talk about the book and do nice author podcast things. It's all lovely. But you kind of forget the sitting in front of your computer yep. on a wet Sunday afternoon when yep. you should be like doing anything but that. Trying to sit at your computer, trying to write stuff and then trying to look at edits and research stuff. It just is really hard work. I do remember sitting in the RHS library in London, the Lindley Library. This was still, this is how long ago it was, when they just opened up after COVID and they were just letting people in on appointment. And I managed to get a day in there doing research. And I remember sitting there and I sort of had this, I don't know how many chapters in I was, but I just suddenly had this epiphany. I was like, you know what, (laughs) I might actually be able to finish this book, which I know sounds ridiculous, but at the time it was like, am I going to be able to do this? This feels so hard. And I had planned it specifically so that it was very discrete chapters, which I could work on because I knew that I could build that up. But even so, it was incredibly hard. And I had many occasions where I wish I'd done 10 plants, not 25. But Never say never. I might do another book. But I think the thing about it is, is that this was the vision that I had that I really wanted to achieve. And I feel like I've achieved that. And we'll see how it goes down, how it's received. And we'll take it from there. But I I just I'm very proud of myself that I managed to produce this book. And I'm just really I don't I feel kind of emotional about it right now. I'm just really I'm really proud of my illustrator and all the hard work she put in speaking to her the other day. We were just like, oh, this is just yay us. We did really well. We've done a good job. So I'm happy. I'm really happy with it. It's truly a labor of love. That is so obvious. It's so good. It's so good. And I'm so happy for you and proud of you and proud to know you. Where can everyone find you on socials and your podcast in addition to obviously getting your book? And we'll link everything in the show notes too. My website is janeperone.com and I will have everything linked there that you need for the book. My podcast on the ledge, still going after all these years. Again, janeperone.com. Still trucking through. Exactly. And people say, oh, haven't you run out of things to say? I'm like, would you say that about football or would yeah. you say that about music or would you say, it's so insulting. I got a rant, which I won't share with you here, but I do have a rant about how underrated gardening and houseplants are as a topic. Anyway. Absolutely. So the podcast. Yeah. And then I'm on Instagram as j.l.perone. I'm even on the old TikTok now as a on the ledge podcast. Oh! Oh, you got um, on TikTok. I gotta I know. go follow oh, you. Yeah, go and have a look at that. That's interesting. And the weird thing about me is like normally people, the thing people find hard is like doing the camp face to camera. That's the only thing I can do. Like I'm so terrible with the camera at doing these arty yeah. shots. The only thing I can do is sit there and talk to you about plants. So that's what you kind of get with that. Hey, that's what we want. Well, congratulations, my friend. I can't wait till I get my physical copy. As one of your early subscribers, I'm just so excited for you. So we'll link everything in the show notes. Go support Jane. If you're in the States, make a fuss and demand the book in your bookstores. Let's have you back soon, Jane. Oh, it's been a pleasure. Thank you, Maria. Yay. Thank you, Jane. I love Jane. I feel so proud to know her. I feel so proud to have kind of come up with her in the podcasting space She's such a hard worker and she truly is a journalist. I mean, this book is fabulous. You know, I think I have maybe a hundred gardening books on my bookshelf. I get sent books almost on a weekly basis because of my podcast. And 
there really isn't a book out there like hers. It's really unique. It's really interesting. And if you are an American, let's rally to get her book distributed in the States. I was kind of heartbroken when she shared that her book is only getting distributed in in the UK. And let's American plant people like rally around Jane. (laughs) All of her links are in the show notes for her socials, her podcast on the ledge. I left this conversation having learned so much. I left reading the book having learned so much. And I do think that is the beauty of this plant hobby that we have, whether you're growing houseplants or whether you're gardening outside, you know, there's always something new to learn. This is a lifelong hobby. There's always a new plant species to investigate. There's always a new lesson to learn. There's always a new growing method to try, right? I mean, the options are endless. And to me, that is so beautiful. And it's such a wonderful opportunity to continue cultivating curiosity as an adult, which is something we don't get to do as much anymore. So anyway, I hope you loved this episode. And I hope until next week, you keep blooming and keep growing joy. Plant friend, thank you so much for tuning in today. If you like what you heard, make sure that you're subscribed to the show so you don't miss an episode. We have incredible episodes lined up in 2023, and I don't want you to miss one topic. And while you're subscribing, would you mind clicking over to the review section and leaving us a review? Reviews are tremendously helpful for the growth of the podcast, so I thank you in advance for helping this podcast reach as many planty earbuds as possible across the globe. If you're looking for more opportunities to grow as a plant parent with Growing Joy content, we've got a ton of free options for you. First, there's the Plant Parent Personality Test. It's so fun. It takes literally three minutes to complete. You take the test, you get your Plant Parent Personality Profile and a curated list of plants, projects, and podcast episodes that are right up your alley, tailored just for you, inspired by your results. The link is in the show notes. Make sure to let me know what your personality is after you take the test. If you're looking to uplevel your plant parent game, check out my website. We've got a bunch of free guides that you can download on topics like understanding natural light, which is actually a three-day worksheet, and nine ways to clean up your office if you need to bring a little bit of planty joy into your work life. And finally, I want to invite you to join the plantiest and kindest corner of the internet, my online garden society. It's both a web platform and an iOS and Android app. It allows our listeners to get together in an algorithm and troll-free online space to swap plant care tips, humble brag about plant wins, and get support when you have plant fails. We have monthly live planty show and tells on Zoom, which are so fun, and even have a living library of planty book recommendations sourced from our community. You can go to jointhegardensociety.com to grab your membership. And for anything else, plant friend, I am here for you. Feel free to drop me a line, whether you have an idea for an episode, an event, or maybe you're even a planty business interested in sponsoring the show. And of course, following me on Instagram and TikTok for daily planty silliness, musings, and tips is always recommended. You can find me across socials at Growing Joy with Maria. Thank you again so much for listening. It is truly my honor and life's delight to help you keep blooming and keep growing joy. Plant care is self-care on Growing Joy, the podcast. Make new plant friends, propagate knowledge, and grow some freaking joy. That's the motto of the Growing Joy Garden Society app and platform, otherwise known as the plantiest and kindest corner of the internet. If you've been an OG listener or a longtime listener, you might also know this app and platform as the Bloom and Grow Garden Party, but with the rebrand, we've rebranded it to the Growing Joy Garden Society. No trolls allowed, kind plant friends only. And if you haven't heard about the society yet, Plant Friend, you got to join. It's my online community that you can access via iOS or Android app or on your computer that I built to connect our international community of plant friends so we can all nerd out together about plants and celebrate our passion for our beloved plant babies. We have members literally all over the world. I'm so in love with this community of sweet plant friends. I can't say enough amazing things about them. But also there's a lot of really cool features about the app you might be interested in. There's dedicated hashtags to all sorts of different subsects of planty passions like houseplants, gardening, plant-inspired DIY projects, growing joy, plants and pets, and so many more. There's a plantrepreneur group. So if you're a planty entrepreneur and you want to connect with other planty entrepreneurs, you can join that group to connect and network. There's a plant swap section. Plus, the entire app, and this is my favorite part, is entirely searchable. So say you want to learn more about Hoya, you type the word Hoya into the search bar, and literally every post ever created about Hoya will 
will pop up. So you can click in, see what other people have been posting about Hoya and learn on your own and crowdsource hair information. It's so cool. But last but not least, it's an amazing way to support the show. Your monthly membership not only goes to sustaining the platform, but it also supports my team of editors, writers, and a community manager that help the world of Bloom and Grow keep growing. So come join us. All you got to do is go to jointhegardensociety.com and sign up for the community plan. Once again, you go to jointhegardensociety.com and click the community plan. Hot take plant friends, there is no one right starter plant. There, I said it. And you know what? While I'm at it, there are also no real plant killers in the world. There are just people who have not figured out their right plants for their lifestyle. This is why I created the free Plant Parent Personality Test. Because Plant Friend, I want you to get thriving alongside your houseplants as quickly as possible. So I made this cutie little Plant Parent Personality Quiz that's totally free for you on my website to take the guesswork out of building your plant collection effortlessly and joyfully. After speaking to thousands of members in our community, I realized that there are about five key plant parent personalities, each one with their unique set of strengths, weaknesses, and a unique set of plants that thrive under their care. For example, a mindful plant parent, someone who wants to engage with their plants daily, use them in their morning routines. If someone gifted that plant parent a succulent and they watered it every day, that succulent would die immediately. However... That drought-resistant succulent is a perfect match for a low-key plant parent, which is someone who travels, has kids, is busy, doesn't have time to engage with their plants every day. They're looking to engage with their plants more like once a week or once every couple of weeks. In addition, obviously, to understanding your light and basic plant care that we provide on this podcast, Happy Plant Parenthood is all about discovering your personality and then picking the right house plants to go with it. It's that simple. No more stressing over your collection. So what plant parent personality type are you, plant friend? All you got to do to find out is take my free quiz on my website and let me know. You can access it at growingjoywithmaria.com slash personality. After taking the test, you'll get an email with a list of plants, podcast episodes, and planty projects that I think would light you specifically up like a full spectrum grow light. So once again, that's growingjoywithmaria.com slash personality for your free plant parent personality test results. (music) 